Welcome to the Scaling Japan podcast, a podcast about how to grow your business from one hundred thousand dollars and beyond. And beyond in the land of the rising sun. Welcome to the Scaling Japan podcast. I'm your host Tyson Batino, and on today's episode, we have Takashi Nishida. He is the representative director and CEO at Sophia Projects, and is a consultant of business development and customer success. He has helped many companies enter the Japanese market and scale through providing sales and customer success support. Takashi is a senior level and professional at doing sales, and we'll focus today on hiring the right salesperson for the Japanese market. So nice to have you, Takashi. And could you please introduce yourself? Thank you for having me here today, Tyson. My name is Takashi Nishida. I'm an independent consultant providing business development and business analyst service, mainly for inbound ICT companies. My previous career consists of 20 years of management consulting and 20 years sales and marketing roles of ICT vendors. So yeah, I'm very excited to have like a real pro today. And I first heard you speak at a business in Japan a LinkedIn event, and I was very impressed with your views and how you approach sales. And I definitely wanted to get you on the podcast. So I'm very excited today. Thank you. I know Jason for a couple of years, and uh, thanks for him. I think I got some projects. He hosting to mainly. Uh, inbound uh, ICT company, not only, only ICT, but inbound companies and foreigners community in Japan, how to make the business. And that is most, mostly close to my career target. Now as a consultant, I'm happy to help the inbound company or person to do business in Japan. Excellent. And so let's get started. So what does a business developer do in Japan? Okay, as a business developer here, I like to explain much about our sales roles, what salesperson is expected to do for inbound, uh, inbound clients. For example, my daily activities fall into the following activities, read generation, set appointment, call preparation and execution, call reporting and internal feedback, deal plan, including proposal and offering. Not only those kind of daily activities, I need to watch the market to assess their services, inbound companies, service and product to match how much meeting with the market demand or requirement from the specific prospect. Yeah, and I think that's probably the difference between your general business developer and someone senior level like yourself, where you can actually assess the market and build a strategy around that. And I think because a lot of companies, they often hire a business developer who can't do that. And sometimes they don't see success. Yeah. There are two categories of clients, large clients and small clients. In this case, startups, large clients, most of the time they have already made product and service. They have some reference customers in their home country. For me, it is mostly the product and services set and the client is looking for new customers in Japan. Uh, it's more like sales activities. And compared to that, as for in the case of uh, small companies, startups, they even have some success in their home countries. They, they try to expand their business in Japan. Then most of the time they find out the difference between the home country's success and how to make success in Japan. So in that case, salesperson not only selling the product or services they created in the home country, I make advice how to fill the gap to meet with customer side, Japanese projects side requirement or needs. Yeah, thanks for going into detail there. Probably it's an obvious question, but why is a salesperson really needed for a company's presence in Japan? Most of the case, Japanese customers are prospect businesses are very conservative. In order to start a business or buy products from the vendors, they prefer to have somebody in Japan 
there are several reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is communication. They prefer to have communication in Japanese. So that's the reason number one. The another reason is they like to find out the stable and continuing relationship to buy a product from vendors. So long ago, uh, some company or prospect told me when I supported inbound uh, software companies. Japanese companies said, if you don't have the office or not register a company, we can't buy product from you because especially for B2B business, once they decide the vendor, they like to have a continued purchase from long time. In order to make it happen, they're expecting the vendors have stable organization of entity and facilities. And if something bad happens, they need someone they know who they can go to directly and trust, right? Yes, trust is important. I think why they um, feel the trust important, it's a historical culture. A Japanese mindset. We are taught in the education. The reason number two is uh, Japanese companies are conservative and they like to have the long last relationship with the vendors. So they just check. It's like a reference check. When the company hiring a new person, they have reference check, second reference. So they prefer if the vendor is very stable or business in Japan, and there won't be the risk of discontinuity or the product service or even the office itself. Yeah, that's really, I know things like having a KK or Kabushiki Gaisha to be incorporated. Sometimes the amount of capital you have in there and a lot of cases too, if like foreign company were to just pull out of Japan, Japanese companies would lose face with their vendors. Yes, true. I think that there are several reasons for long lasting a relationship because actually B2B product is built in their final product. That is sure. And other things, and when the buyers provide a, a product service to the end users, they make adjustment, enhancement, and it comes to the vendors of a B2B product. So vendors need to meet those requirements. So that means a um, inbound company needs to invest for the organization, not only sales, but uh, support and product design and development, etc. However, in order to meet with all these requirements, salesperson is key to listen to the buyer's voice. Sometimes he needs to make priority, which request has higher demand and importance. Thanks for sharing, Anna. Could you tell us a little bit more? Okay, uh, why BD is necessary in Japan? So not only BD is selling the product, it's business development. That means they need to find out where is needs of the buyers and what needs to be fulfilled. So in order to make the business successful, not only listening to one client, but also multiple clients or prospects and assess the market. That means what the inbound companies need to do if there's a gap between original product and um, even it was success in their home country, they need to make enhancement and need to put some effort to meet with the Japanese buyers prospect voice or requirement. That leads to the successful accomplishment, in this case, selling the product or service to Japanese client. It is second, however, mostly that inbound company expect for the sales or business developer is his network. That means uh, he can reach out potential prospect to meet with uh, the sales product. Business developers and salesperson will list up the target companies and make a plan for calls. And after making the visit or call, inbound company itself and the product and customer values and here you find that if there is a pain point within the buyer side and if anything needed for offering i think these are some very good points you know you mentioned about network one common mistake i see startups make is that probably series a or maybe seed level is that they might hire a business developer in japan who's affordable but they have no network and then they give this person unrealistic sales quotas because mm -hmm. they have no network. So they have to start from zero. 
probably one to two years to start getting traction. Another guest, we did an episode with Timothy Connors, but he talked about product market Japan fit. And so I think the salesperson can talk to companies on the ground and mm-hmm. see if there actually is a need for the offering. And more for the startup sites, like for startups, I usually recommend probably the founders should, if you're a smaller f- startup, probably finding out yourself if there's product market Japan fit rather than outsourcing it. So the business developer can actually focus more on, let's say getting sales as opposed to uh, figuring things out if you can do that, but that's not always possible. So I think that's one thing that, uh, especially foreign startups misunderstand about Japan is hiring a sales or a business developer, a salesperson who has no network and then uh, expecting big results. I've seen it so many times. It's just, uh, if you do that, it is a, for me, that's like a face palm type of thing. Mm-hmm. Sorry, mm-hmm. Uh, my question is what do foreign companies tend to misunderstand about Japan? Sometimes even the inbound seller side preparation is not mature enough. Some companies try to enter the Japanese market. Business speed is important, but if Japanization of product or service, value proposition, support scheme, etc., is not ready, then the initiative will fail. Second stakes I found is I'm not sure if it's a good thing or not, but sometimes the foreign inbound company is not flexible enough to meet the Japanese buyer's real needs. Focus of offering is important, but the buyer side has its own agenda, issues, and priorities. So the seller side is expected to meet with the buyer's agenda. I think this is a tough part. Especially for the company who is trying to focus on very niche market. And I worked for the, some outsourcing service providers. And same as Western companies, uh, their offering is very rigid strict. And if customer asks some additional functions, features, and some service with low cost, they say, no, this is the scope out of scope uh, we charge fee. But from buyer's standpoint, um, if they, yeah, especially for the first customer case in Japan, mm. it's a risk. <laughs> so they ask to meet their agenda. Of, I've, I've heard of that. And from, yeah. I guess the seller side, they want to have their operation streamlined. Mm-hmm. Yes, so true. they don't have to take extra costs, but on the buyer's side, as let's say there's no flexibility and if something bad happens, then. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes very aggressive case or from the side, they say, okay, if you provide us the deal, it's free. Take it. They are not always free, but if the first success, a project is successful, they ex- set aside expecting to have more bigger deal to come out. So in order to reach that point, they know uh, establishing the relationship of trust, even the cost is, or deal size is very small, they make special offer. Another thing is uh, sometimes uh, they look over the buyer, decision maker, or stakeholders have complex relationships and structures. Also, their consensus building and decision making process is very complex. So it takes more time to move forward than 40 companies' plans. In short, it, it takes time to open up Japanese account. However, the fruit is relatively large. So selling side need to be patient to find out the who is real uh, king of stakeholders. And stakeholders has uh, different uh, roles, financial stakeholders, user stakeholders, system stakeholders, and end user stakeholders. So when I do the project, I map up the stakeholders relationship. Ah, very nice. And influence. Yeah. And I think what a lot of companies don't get to is that let's say in the short term, there is a lot of work that needs to get involved and it takes time. But if you do get the client, possibly compared to your overseas clients, the the lifetime of the client could be higher because they actually stay with you longer. 
Yeah. And because they take so long to switch or let's say make decisions, yes, the likelihood they'll choose your competitor is yeah. much lower as well. Yeah, true. Uh, the switching cost is very high. So once it's selected, once we get in, we will try to do the best. Even the first project is very uh, priced low. It's the uh, same concept as uh, freemium. The first offering, the, the price tag is zero. Uh, once a relationship is established, the project offering will be more large scale and yeah. then get more big fruits. Yeah, and I think sometimes you also underestimate the risk that maybe your internal champion is taking mm -hmm. to yeah. introduce your product. Yes, true. Yeah, yeah. There's a risk and um, we need to educate or nurture that client side. Yeah, that means we need to put condition. We, we, mm -hmm. Nobody can survive with zero price product service for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. And I want to ask you, May, why does code calling often not work in Japan for foreign corporations? Yes, I think this can be said not only for the Japanese market, but also for the other territories, especially for B2B products. If a seller side likes to have an inter meeting with Japanese enterprise employee, then he needs to have either a direct connection or introduction by someone the prospect trust. In the case of the foreign company or corporation, it is more important than local share because of the potential communication gap in a language linguistic gap. And generally, the buyer companies tends to avoid the risk of lacking stability continuation of the seller's Japanese entity. Also, the professional buyers already overwhelmed by many cold calls, and he is occupied with many tasks as well. I might receive cold calls many times a week, but not picking up the phone or just to confirm the caller's number, then later I search on the web to verify which company was calling. In my honest opinion, the cold call approach is not for B2B product and product and service. And most of the time, it ends up waste of time for both ends. Thanks for sharing. Another thing is it may depends on the product service they try to sell. In the case of not B2B, but B2C product, the cold call may happen, but still the seller needs to have an impressive value proposition and easy to understand our product pitch or video to get buyer's traction at the first meeting. Let me talk about a modern sales approach. There's a very successful video shopping company Japan Net Takata, which is the number one appliance seller in Japan, I believe. I have never received a phone call or email from that company, but it has an excellent product intro show on the TV with attractive presenters and aggressive discount offering with a limited time window validation. Then, the company enjoys never-ending inbound calls, Japanese Takata. Interestingly, the founder Akira Takata worked for his father's camera retail store, then spun out to establish his own camera retail business at the age of 30 in the Kyushu in 1986. Then, in 1990, by request of acquaintance, he introduced the camera in the local radio station's newly started radio shopping program. Immediately, he sold 50 products. Then he started a TV shopping show with a local TV station in 1994. His company developed its own recording studio, which contributed to creating quality presentation videos. Together with Mr. Takata's attractive talk with local dialect, the TV shopping program became a smash hit. 
he started create and provide TV shopping programs for all other TV stations in Japan in year 2000. And his company recorded sales of Japanese yen 178 billion in 2010. It was USD 2 billion. This story's takeaway for cold call is that it is necessary to have number one attractive and quality inter story in the video pitch and number two excellent presenters to catch the buyers out quickly. This number two depends on the personality, I think. One of the common challenges I see with my consulting clients is not having any staff internally who can drive marketing strategy and execution to the next level. This really limits the growth trajectory of a company, especially for a leader like you that wants to go from 30 million to 500 million yen a year and does not have the time to spend years on learning through trial and error. To solve this problem, I'm launching a marketing agency that can help companies like yours to increase leads and closing rates through SEO, Google Maps, content marketing, and websites that convert. Head over to scalingyourcompany.com and book a free consultation. Let's talk about what your business needs are, where your current strategy is letting you down, and how we can help you see real results with the methods I've successfully implemented at multiple companies myself. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really interesting story. It's actually the first time I heard about it, but yes, uh, they are everywhere on Japanese TV. And moving on, what types of contracts do salespeople have with companies? Okay, I think there are three types. One is salary, is 100% salary, um, stable salary. And number two is combination of salary and bonus. And number three is bonus only or compensation only. And uh, there are pros and cons for each. For number one case, uh, salary only. However, since I'm not a Charles hiring specialist, I just communicate my thoughts in, from my experience. Pro for the company in this first case, salary only, it helps to attract good talent to build a brand. It provides long-term commitment to establish its own business in the target market. And the employee retention will be high. So that's a key of the long-lasting relationship with client. On the other hand, the con side for the company is more expensive hiring budget is required than other options. Pro for the employee is he can expect the stable income. Con side for employee is that he must accept that uh, sometimes total income won't be very high because it lacks proportional bonus part for the deal he brought. It's not included in this case any uh, size of deal that sorry is always saying gotcha and uh, what type of person do you think would want the salary or would be ideal for this structure i think someone he prefers to have a stable and relatively long lasting income rather than higher total income with incentive this salary type uh, remuneration is usually asked for by the job performer that mostly provides certain promised output like consulting advice for the inbound companies in combination with delivery phase tasks like system design, development tasks, test, operation and support, project management, quality assurance in exchange of time he investment. Thank you. What type of expectations would they have for a foreign company before joining? I think a um, foreign company needs to have concrete and pragmatic contract to compensate for his service. Gotcha. And I think the second type you mentioned was salary plus maybe bonus. And maybe what are some of the pros and cons from the employee side? Okay. Yeah. This number two type 
is between number one salary only and number three bonus only. Or and it is a combination of fixed payment and incentive. In my experience, this is the most widely used by inbound IT product service providers to the Japanese market. Ratio between the salary as known as base portion and the incentive portion varies. If the company already has existing customer and listed a qualified prospect, then the base incentive is high, say 80 or 90%. On the contrary, if the company asks BD to get new customer rather than taking care of existing customers, then the base percentage is low, like 50 or 60%. Uh, thank you for sharing the percentages. That's uh, really interesting and I think will be very useful for the listeners. Yeah, this is just an ex uh, example from my experience. Uh, just uh, one difference, but the company can change the ratio uh, sometimes 30-40% for the base portion. It's very aggressive scheme. And so Sarah, uh, salesperson needs to very aggressively to find out new client. Yeah. And what type of person do you think would be ideal for the salary plus bonus? In my experience, uh, this is for the company's common uh, scheme of uh, IT uh, salesperson. I think this is good for the guy who has a contact network, already has established network, and he's familiar with standard sales process like lead generation, qualification, discovery, proposal, and closing, and also uh, knowledge experience with target industry. For example, financial service or manufacturing, those industry segment. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Uh, I mean, if you're going to go 50% bonus based, then I mean, you need a means to get sales rather than starting from zero. Yeah. I sometimes see foreign businesses try to force this model on really junior level salespeople. Yeah, so young, active guys expected to knock the door more than, yeah, it's a good um, fundamental thing to knock the door as much as possible. And after that, I think not only him, but the support of other members of the uh, seller side he find out that opportunities, uh, clarification, qualified the uh, leads, and create a attractive a pitch of offering, and then support of senior person. Uh, he goes to closing. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And I think we can move on to. I think the last one was uh, commission only. Or mm -hmm. okay, uh, commission only. The pro from um, a company is that can mitigate the financial investment to engage BD or salesperson. It's common for BD to give up the fee for his invested time. Many of acquaintance of mine, BDs do not like and accept this scheme. They say if the vendor has strong confidence in its product service, it does not provide this compensation yeah. scheme. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Or I, I would agree with that as well. Yeah, somebody told me if uh, you go into the war or fight, you need to have a good sword. Then you can't have fight with short sword dagger <laughs> or the sword with rust. So in order to have a good sword, you need to make some investment. And I think probably the only way I would consider it is if the company has, their marketing is so good that they just have so many leads that they can't have. And they just need someone to handle all these highly qualified leads. But mm -hmm. if, if you don't have a lot of leads or, you know, the salesperson is going to have to do a lot of the work on their side, then. Mm -hmm. 
So in that case, uh, his service person needs to invest his time for uh, find out qualified lead. Yeah, and if your product is so attractive, uh, probably you wouldn't even offer this in the first place. <laughs> True. I think we can move on, but kind of similar to the previous question, but what would a company need to do or exhibit to attract an experienced salesperson like yourself in Japan? Yes. The professional uh, business developer provide, provides good uh, feedback by listening to that uh, prospect or clients. And then uh, the company makes well listening to the BD's assessment about gaps between the client side expectation and the inbound vendors offering. Then follow BD's advice to fill the gap. Sometimes it is tough for inbound startup company to make flexible change or pivot because of financial constraint. However, I think making something happen is important for the Japanese market. As you know, many of the Japanese companies are conservative, picky, and try to mitigate the risk. But on the other hand, these are client conditions to win deals. In other words, it is important to make the things happen. Yeah, I think sometimes companies don't realize like your connection with the salesperson is actually a relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. And this relationship will bring some very important information that can be that uh, who is the champion in the client what is coming next project plan what is the process how the decision is made yes that kind of information people can't find on the web so somebody on the ground is needed to bring to the company thanks for sharing that and i think kind of a big question on everyone's mind is also where can i find a salesperson in japan uh yes actually there is a um, Recruiters network. Yeah, the many company recruiting company has a list of uh, sales candidate. However, uh, you can find very even the brilliant level of candidate on SNS, for example, LinkedIn or exhibition seminar event focused for sales related solution service or more directly some boutique consulting firm which provide BD service for Japanese clients. Recently, um, more business development activities were focused in Japan. So there are several boutique consulting firms specialized for business development. It, they are more focused on enterprise clients because the investment will be large from enterprise. However, we can get knowledge of uh, business development from those boutique consulting firm. And so maybe at an exhibition or seminar, yeah. how would, how would I meet them? Would they, if I have a booth, would they come up to me or? Yeah, that, that is one approach. For example, we set up a booth, which is financed by inbound consortium companies. And we provide opportunities uh, to introduce the product and service. Uh, of inbound companies, and then the salesperson by chance meet the service product. So it is one of the channel to find out a sales process professional. And also important thing is a networking session of those uh, seminar or exhibitions. Recently, I found uh, the real networking event happening after Corona. I think this is a new movement in 2023. Uh, actual real networking and seminar happening face to face on site. So that is a chance. And I think for startups, I've heard cases where there'll be a pitch event and mm -hmm. for your pitch event, you would introduce your new, you introduce your solution. When it comes time to make a request, you could, you say like, oh, I'm looking for someone to help sell our product in Japan. Mm -hmm. And if it's related to someone, especially there's often people with 
uh, salespeople, freelance salespeople with big network who attend these events looking for uh, potential ideas and services to sell to their yes. network. There are organizers or organizing companies for those events. And it has every quarter, the meeting, gathering, networking. So I think it's good to pre present there, to be there, to get yourself known to those sales organizers. Thank you for listening to this episode of Scaling Japan. In addition to serving as your fine host, I also provide advisory and coaching services to business owners who want to 2x, 5x, and even 10x their business. So stop holding your company and your team and your employees back and let me help you and your company scale. Find more information at scalingyourcompany.com. Now back to the episode. So it's been great to interview and uh, it was definitely a link to your LinkedIn profile in the show notes. But did you have any uh, ending comments or thoughts? Yes, thank you for this session. And lastly, since innovation is a buzzword these days, I like to introduce a categorization or innovations because I believe it helps to think about the value proposition. I think there are three types of innovation. Number one, product service innovation. This is what you make and deliver to the clients. It is relatively easy to communicate the value proposition because it is tangible and a client can easily recognize the solution with and without the product. For example, smartphone and apps, EV, electric vehicle, renewable energy. These are types of this innovation. Number two, process innovation. This is how to make and deliver product and service to clients. Generative AI, chat GPT can be uh, this type of innovation because it changes the process of creating knowledge. Also, blockchain is this type. It changes the process. It is also relatively easy to communicate the created client value in the form of reduced time and cost for customer satisfaction by the new process. And mostly the number one, number two combination, it's coins, tail, or head. Product is head, process is tail. So this kind of pattern can happen. And there are third pattern, which is mind innovation. This means a significant change in people's inner mind, attitude, or culture to deliver change, to drive change. This value proposition is relatively hard to gauge, but still we can set up KPIs like the number of new product project carried out, ETC, etc. This is a reflection of if an organization dynamic is fostered or not. It can be brought by excellent leadership, crown, or change agent. Also these days, essential factors to generate innovation or uh, customer centric, agility, and collaboration. Anyway, I believe an uh, innovation can fall into these types or combination of these three. Recently, by observing Japanese companies' slowness to adapt to new trends like DX, AI, EV, renewable energy, renewable energy, etc., some people have started to say that mind innovation is most important to catch up and establish a sustainable society. The customer value as a BD is very exciting and worth acting to play a role for these innovations together with inbound companies. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I think that was a great point to finish off because essentially getting sales is providing value. And you've pointed out three ways to provide significant value to a potential target client. 
Thank you. And I think that、um, newcomer or new entrant to the market needs to bring different value from existing players. So when you think about the change or innovation, those angles can be useful, I think. Thank you very much.